I'm ABT. Pauly, how, how does one prepare for a fight? Well, uh, before a fight, uh, you, you first uh, matched up with an opponent, uh, with your manager, excuse me. Uh, so uh, you've got at least eight weeks to train, and uh, so you, uh, you, you, you start your training, your road work, and into the gym, and you box, uh, uh, hit the heavy bags, shadow boxing, and uh, jump roping, and after you hit the heavy bag, you usually spot three rounds, two to three rounds, sometimes four. And the condition of how you are, and it's up to your trainer to find out whether you're up to three rounds to spar or four. And he cuts you down when he thinks you're overworked and uh, builds you up your stamina because it's a, a tough uh, eight weeks of training because the you know, body is, gets down too fine. You lose a lot of your strength, so sometimes they have to lay you off. And uh, Sure. Well, what's the mindset the night before a fight, the day of the fight? What, what, what's going through the mind of a boxer? Well, uh, going through the mind, there's a lot of things uh, going through the mind. Mostly is uh, trying to study your opponent and uh, what uh, combinations would work on him and where your main attack would be and, uh, and your strategy of how you're, uh, you're going to uh, deliver these punches. You're fighting a tall guy like I always fought. My, my job was to try to get inside all the time because standing in the middle of the ring would be fighting his fight. So I had to get inside them all the time, bobbing and weaving and slipping on the punches. Once I got inside, I tried to stay in there until the referee would break us apart if we clinched. And, uh, like to, I've always had to work my corner, cut the ring uh, angles down and to get them into the corners where I could do most of my damage. You know. That that's where you did most of your damage. I, I've heard from a lot of florists. Um, coming into the fight now, when you say um, you know. Uh, when when you have your own strategy in your head, do you have any preparation such as you know, vid, you know, I mean, back in the 50s, I mean, there's no videotaping, of course, of boxing fights, but I mean, do you have like scouts in football to tell you how this guy fights, what you have to do? Yes, you have. Uh, if you get, they pick out your opponent, you're going to fight. Uh, you try to get the uh, trainers who saw him fight before, and uh, that's the best they could do is only give you a style and try to pick out your spar partners that fight the same way he does. If he was a tall guy and it was a, a good boxer or counter puncher, well, they'd put you in your sparring partners with the same type of height, counter puncher, so you'd be able to uh, be used to working with that type of fighter. Sure. So, so you're that much ahead of the game. That, that's uh, that's that's interesting. Where did you train? Where did you uh, box back then? Well, uh, the, them days was a new garden gym. Uh, we all great trainers trained. Uh, I was very honored to be there. The, the gym that Joe Ross uh, uh, trained in, and some of the great old timers: uh, uh, Tony DeMarco, Tommy Collins, uh, Red Priest, uh, uh, Joe Rendon, the great fighters in them days. Uh, right after, the, especially right after the Second World War, was, was one of your toughest fighters. Came out of boxing in them days. Uh, uh, Rocky Graziano's and uh, and on and on. Uh, I could probably mention them all night long if I can remember them all. Yeah. You know. Well, after World War II, though, th those were all the uh, the tough guys. I mean, those were some some wars going on. Yeah. Well, they were they were a lot hungry, you know, when they came out of the service. Uh, hungry kids, uh, most of them uh, coming out of tough areas of, uh, of Massachusetts, Boston, all around. And uh, so when they fought, they were uh, they were fighting. Uh, for success and for real and, uh, and with the dreams and hopes that they reach the, the top so they could have the, the luxuries in life that uh, they wanted to have and uh, so you had some tough guys out there you really had sure sure the um, Boston has, has really been in involved in the boxing for a long long time I mean they've really hyped it up and I mean there's been plenty of good boxers coming out of the uh, Boston and New England area who do you think would, would be the best well, uh, as far as Boston's concerned, and maybe across the uh, country, you know, the first great heavyweight came from uh, John L. Sullivan, uh, who came from Boston, and uh, a lot of his fights were around the Dorchester area, whether it be in an alley or uh, uh, back of a bunch of uh, uh, bales of hay of, uh, behind the... Or in the parking lot, yeah. Uh, the parking lots in them days, sure, our saloons. <laughs> and uh, so from there, they, we had, you know, great fights. We had one of the greatest of all times, is Rocky Marciano. Matter of fact, we're not too f far from his hometown, and I had the great pleasure of being the fighter that he took a special trip out uh, from Florida to watch me fight uh, Dave Grant at the Boston Garden. And after that fight, he uh, he wanted to take over being my manager and take me back to California and work with some uh, great trainers back there and uh, be my uh, 
manager, and uh, uh, that never felt uh, came through because of a tie up with another manager. Other managers, you know, boxers have a problem signing too many contracts, you know. <laughs> In them days, that was a, a big problem, you know. Sure. Well, you see why Paulie Stivaletta is here tonight on ABT, the NEABF on ABT, all boxing television. We'll be right back. The NEABF here on ABT, all boxing television. We're with Paulie Stivaletta. Paulie, you have a little story for us about uh, the national anthem? Yes. Uh, excuse me. Uh, when the sign oh, Getting ready to rumble here. Maybe, maybe we'll check between rounds, Paulie. Here on ABT? Nah, we'll check it. We, we want to hear it. Uh, well, back in 1965, when Sonny Liston fought up in Lewiston, Maine, uh, I became uh, very close to Sonny to, uh, when he first started in Dedham at the uh, uh, Holiday Inn and his training there, so they needed a guy to take him that was a fighter where to run and do road work. So he got to like me and kept me with him, and uh, when the fight was transferred to Lewiston, Maine, I went with him there. So uh, uh, we worked, we trained, and went in the morning to run, and went, I got him his stuff ready with his trainers. But the, the biggest thing of the whole fight was the knockout and the, the punch that nobody saw. But the, uh, the day of the, um, uh, of the fight, Robert Goulet was asked if he would do uh, the national anthem. Because we were all staying at Poland Springs at the time, because they had a bar and a nightclub open all night for all the celebrities to come in. So uh, Robert Goulet, I think, got a little too much of a party night. So the next night was the fight. And so he drove in my car with Sonny Liston to the fight, to the arena, and uh, they asked him if he would sing the song, and he didn't really want to do the national anthem because he had a few drinks. And so uh, they offered him $10,000, and he took it. So when he got up into the ring, the, the national anthem started, and he said three verses and forgot the words. He stopped and stared around, and the crowd started roaring. And so he just went on to the ending of the song, and. Uh, of course, uh, after it was all over, he said, you know, I've, I've had about 50 hit records out there. Nobody uh, uh, ever talks about those. He says, I made one mistake in the national anthem, and, and it's been written, written up all over the world. You know? He'll never live that one down. He, said, he got more famous out of the national anthem than he did on all those great songs. That he sure, did. That's, that's all right. You know, uh, when you mentioned sparring partners, Sonny Liston, was that the uh, most known name that you sparred with? or? No, I didn't spy with him. I was I was part of the, uh, his training camp. I was too small, uh, uh, welterweight to uh, heavyweight. But he wanted me part of the camp, being with him, walking with him. He uh, got to like me, I guess, as a pet. And uh, I'd take him to where he was going to run and uh, and do his jogging. And then I'd, he'd call me to come up to his room if he wanted orange juice and like to take raw eggs too. And, uh, and then after dinner, we'd take a little walk around Poland Springs. And uh, I was very. Uh, glorifying for me to be with a heavyweight champion and taking a liking into me and, and keeping me very close to him. So uh, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a memory I will never forget. What, what, excuse me, Paulie. Of course, uh, the, that fight was uh, the punch, the phantom punch that nobody saw, and there's been the controversy on that from time and time again. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I was asked to speak on radio in Europe uh, for the sport writers in Europe and all over. And, uh, of what I thought would happen there, you know, and of course that night when he got hit, nobody saw the punch, he went down. People were yelling at ringside. I was standing beside George Savello, the heavyweight champ of Canada, which uh, uh, later on fought for Cassius Clay for the title. And he yelled out, he was shot. They thought he got shot in the ring because of the way he went down. 